So let's go right ahead to our next session. The topic is economic and social impact of gastronomy tourism, the effect in the whole value chain and the sustainable development goals. And in this session, we're going to talk about the challenges that gastronomy value chain has to tackle in order to preserve authenticity and identity. So here to moderate this session, I would like to invite up on stage Mr. Inyaki Castellumandi. This is Mr. Inyaki coming up on stage now. He is an economist with a Master in Management and Strategy for Tourist Destinations. He is currently an independent consultant with expertise in tourism industry. He is the consultant in UNWTO, consultant in food tourism, and also in the Bass Culinary Center as well. And joining Mr. Inyaki are our four speakers who will be on stage too. May I invite up on stage? Ms. Laura Fandos, Director of Strategy, Global DIT Spain. She's coming up on stage. Also, may I invite Ms. Jia Choi, President of Ongo Food Communications, Republic of Korea. Next, Ms. Barkan Tunisia from Murdoch University, Singapore office. And next, Ms. Gael Van Hue, Vice President of Michelin Experiences for East Asia and Australia. Can we give a round of applause to welcome all of our panelists to the stage? Thank you. Ms. Sinyaki, the stage is yours. Well. Wow. This works? Yep. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for staying with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is the last discussion table of the World Gastronomy uh, Tourist Forum, and today we have a hard day uh, with the workshops, and I understand that most of you are tired. But I have a, this is a message for the international participants. Uh, tomorrow we have a World Cafe, uh, like today. And the uh, World Cafe is part of the workshops. Then I hope to, uh, I wait for you tomorrow at the end of the workshops, okay? I miss some one of you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for staying with us. I, and I think it was a smart decision because uh, the panel of the session uh, is really interested. And I think that the topic, uh, uh, the economic and social impact of gastronomy tourism, the effect on the whole value change and on the sustainable development goals, will help us to close the circle that our colleagues opened yesterday. Remember that yesterday the discussion was focused on technology and on the customer journey. And today we are going to try to face the challenge that the agents who participate in the value change of uh, gastronomy tourism. In this sense, we have uh, for excellent professionals, uh, we will approach this topic from four different perspectives because we have uh, strategic consulting, we have a uh, lot of experience in managing, uh, we have experience in the university researching but also strategic uh, planning and we have experience in publishing. Then I think it's going to be great for the, for, for the, the discussions. And they come from important leading uh, destinations in, 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 in gastronomy tourists like yeah. Spain, Korea, Singapore, Singapore and France with a long experience in, in, in this area of Asia. Well, our first speaker is Laura. Uh, Laura Fandos is from Spain and is, she is the strategy director of the prestigious consultant firm uh, Global Deed and she helps public administrations uh, to consolidate public and private ecosystems of actors to promote initiatives throughout the gastronomy tourist value chain. I'm sure that your experience will, your experience will be uh, very interesting for the discussion. Then, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. My presentation today is going to, to uh, go about uh, food tourism development for small communities. And it's probably very relevant for the topic that we're discussing on this forum, because if we want to uh, use tourism as a, as a tool for development, uh, where uh, a small communities is where the, uh, the, the result comes through. Uh, so we, we are going to be talking about the whole value chain, where it, where, it hit, where it lands in the ground, and we're going to be talking how tourism can, can um, promote the, uh, the development agenda of 
governments, of multilateral institutions, of uh, private, private partnerships, NGOs, or um, even philanthropy. All of these entities are somehow or another promoting tourism as a source of development. And my presentation is going to be, at the end, uh, lessons learned from our work along the last 20 years in this, in this field. Um, we do tourism development and specifically we've done uh, gastronomy tourism in both consolidated and emerging destinations. So I hope uh, I can provide a very practical view of what happens and what, are the, the, um, the, what is the best way to go about, about this. And what do we find when we want to develop tourism, and specifically gastronomy tourism, in a small community? Uh, for example, this is in, in Mexico, where we, where we have a long experience working, and where tourism has been seen as a way to help uh, places that really don't have any other kind of industry, that have a lot of social problems and economic problems, and how can we... Um, use something as valuable as, for example, their, their traditional gastronomy, which is a world heritage, uh, how can we use that and make it uh, something that could drive development and jobs and, and wealth and opportunities, not just for, for the big industry, but for the communities and for everybody involved in the value chain, not just for the providers. What do we find? That when we try to, to, um, to develop tourism, uh, we see a lot of uh, initiatives that somebody has an idea, either a company or a government, they drop it, they, they work it for a year or two, and then forget it. Uh, we, there's no continuity. Uh, we find these communities are very vulnerable, socially and economically. Uh, they often are, are subject to a lot of stress from um, insecurity, or, or insecurity can be um, uh, economic or social, or even uh, have problems with like migration, uh, lack of infrastructure, food security, uh, lack of access to, to the financing sector, or really these people can sometimes live in a, in a completely parallel economy. Nothing to do with what happens, for example, in a city where you have a consolidated structures to go and, and, and government services and, and all sorts of other, other, other services. We also have to think about uh, women as the subjects of, of a lot of the policies because, um, as you know, like for example, microcredit programs are more successful when they are directed to women because women reinvest in the, in the welfare of the family. Um, that's not to say that men don't, but they do at a much smaller percentage. So, also changing the role of women in traditional communities can be a very sensitive issue because um, you are changing the societal structure and you cannot just go in and, like what we say in Spain, like, like, like a horse in a china store. And also uh, poverty. Uh, we must not forget that from the perspective of, 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 a, of an institution, you are dealing with people who have who their, 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 their list of problems start with probably with poverty and lack of access to a lot of resources. And so we need to take all that into consideration before considering any kind of uh, intervention in a community. Having said that, um, we are f firm believers that uh, tourism can help uh, development and, it can, and also not just economic development, but development in a way that is socially in, and respectfully inclusive. That means we can create opportunities for everybody, for the uh, unprivileged groups and for the established companies and for, and for even the, the intermediation. We, we can create opportunities across the value chain. And this is very important because this is what the Sustainable Development Goals are all about. And so how do we do this? If we leave it in the hands of the community, very often what happens is that they lack the, the, the knowledge and the know-how and, and the means to, to, to go. If you leave it to the private initiative, um, that's, 
to, to help communities is not part of their business. They, they, they may do it tangibly, but it's not the core of their business. So we understand policy as a way to accelerate the empowerment of these communities, of these people, and, and to find in tourism a way for social development and social and economic development. So how we do do this? Well, we need both a strategic framework to work and an operational framework. What is the strategic framework? We need to do what we're doing and why. And so, do we have a vision? Do we know what we want to achieve? We're not, I'm not talking about intervening in a small community or two. I'm talking about if I want to develop, I'm a destination, I want to develop food tourism or any kind of tourism, I have to think of all the communities. I don't have to invent the wheel every time I go somewhere. I, I have to have a plan and I have to do, to do work that is um, viable for the whole destination. So I need to think the long term and I need to be acting to, in a way that I get results in the short term because I can build on those results. Um, we need uh, critical mass. We, it's not worth to intervene for, for 50 people. We, we need to be thinking hundreds. And what for? We need to create revenue and we create uh, opportunities. Operational framework will be what are we going to do and how? How to build a program, the method? Uh, do we need an IT platform? Do we need uh, um, best practices? Do we need training? What, what are my, my resources to do this? And when something works, scale up and replicate. Scale up and replicate. It's, this is very important. And for example, we did this traditional cooks program with allowed financing. Um, uh, we had uh, this, these women with traditional, traditional chefs. Uh, we were listed in directories, so the, the, the tour operators and the public would access them and, and, and invite their businesses. Uh, we helped them with, the, uh, with their businesses to make it more competitive, to be at the market with know-how. Um, we need to think there's not just tourism development, but you can get sources and financing from all sorts of uh, funds, uh, from SMEs and, and, and uh, other like community development funds. There's, there's all sorts of programs that can add up to this. And, well, just to sum up, think big, don't, don't think little community, think big communities. Um, leadership has to be very clear, either from the public sector or the private, whoever leads, but the, uh, the implementation has to be shared by all actors, by all stakeholders. Financing, you, um, your, your budget is your policy, you cannot act without this. Uh, engage everybody, um, adapt and focus, or focus on those who are going to deliver the most results. And if it works, scale up and replicate. Um, I think I'm a runner of time, but that, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Um, the next speaker is uh, Jia Cho from Korea. Uh, she's the president and founder of Ongo Food Communications, and since 2008, uh, her company has offered immersive food tours and cooking classes for visitors to Korea. And I would like to point out that uh, she founded Korea Culinary Tourist Association in 2012 and served as a chairman. Dear Ja, the floor is yours. Thank you, Inaki. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm very honored to be here with you. Um, I want to introduce uh, about the innovations and a few trials that um, Korea has been done for the last two years. So um, I'm running a food tour company in Seoul, Korea since 2008. And I'm also consulting a Korean tourism organization and government to develop uh, how to develop the local resource, food related resource to a culinary destination. So having a good, good food, especially having a meal together for Koreans, is very important. So in Korean word, we say 안녕하세요 or 식사하셨어요, which means, did you have lunch? It doesn't mean that, um, did you really have lunch? It means that, how are you? So for us, it's really, really important. OK, let's go to the next page. So uh, the gastronomy tourism in Korea, in recent years, uh, actually, there are a lot of changes. So, um, as you can see here, we do have traditional table setting, uh, as you can see on the top, and also the modern cuisine, such as uh, chicken and beer, 
Uh, some people call it it's Korean fried chicken. Some, as a nickname, some people call it KFC, believe it or not. And we love to have uh, chicken and beer as well. So um, again, the culinary tourism is a very niche market. And the TV show, as you can see on the right side, or the TV drama focusing are focusing more on local gourmet. And I think this is one of the reasons why many people, Koreans and also uh, foreigners, the foodies, leads to a new hidden uh, destination. Um, the paradigm shift has been changed a lot, I think. Uh, for example, five or seven years ago, people would go to a countryside or to a restaurant just to eat. But recently, uh, tourist interest has been narrowed to a cities like big cities, Seoul, Busan, or I don't know if you have heard about the Pyeongchang, where the previous, I mean, the, this Oli Winter Olympic game was held, rather than Korea itself. So. Um, the region itself from Korea, country Korea to region, and also the paradigm shift also from eating to more explorer or experience. So people's attention has expanded from just eating good food to exploring and knowing more about the ingredient, um, the local people, the producers. So the characteristic that only the region possesses rise with the competitiveness of the region. So people's interest focus on more intangible assets, such as culture, special skill, a person who has a special skill. And so now um, the development of food-related experiences uh, will make the area attractive as a gastronomy destination. So the changes in consumers' taste affect local economies as well. So and. I think this should be carefully developed so that gastro-tourism can be utilized as an economic development strategy. From now, I want to share a few examples that we've been trying uh, uh, for the last one or two years. Uh, this is a picture of, I don't know if you have heard about ginseng, Korean ginseng is considered a premium um, product. And uh, again, a decade ago, um, including a company like my company or Korea government, we tried to just promote the ginseng itself. But nowadays, the balancing between tangible and intangible resources is very crucial. So as you can see, a person who has a knowledge is an old man that is finding a nice ginseng from the from the mountain, and also they have a very special skill to grow ginseng. For example, they hate lights, so it has to be needs a very dark tent on the top to have a nice um, ginseng. So the, uh, to share this kind of uh, knowledge it can be uh, a part of the food tour. So just eating is not, eat, you cannot eat all day. So sometimes uh, you learn a little bit from local people. Sometimes you join uh, experience. And of course, you have good food at the end. So guess what it is? This is all another example. Um, in Korea, we do have four distinct seasons. And if you happen to visit Korea in late autumn or winter, uh, this, this is all edible sea vegetables that we love to consume during um, the cold weather. And actually, uh, I wanted to explain a little bit more about the ingredient because it's so interesting. But for example, uh, it doesn't, many of these doesn't have name in English. For example, we do consume, we do eat 10 different types of seaweed, but there's only two different words for English, uh, seaweed and kelp. But in Korea, we do have 10 different uh, languages for it. And uh, for those people who like uh, winter food or uh, um, the, the sea vegetable or seafood, uh, many people request Jeju Island, which is located in the southern part of Korea. And this lady, uh, we call it Henyo in Korean word, is a diving woman and she's listed as an intangible heritage by UNESCO last year. So she's able to stay in the sea. She harvests all the abalone, the sea vegetable, uh, without breathing over seven minutes in the sea. So, uh, of course, 
we can easily go anywhere to eat abalone or good seafood, but we, some people travel all the way down to meet her and uh, listen to her storytelling. So the key to maximizing the benefits of the food tourism, I think, is local region, regional development and is understanding the role of the intangible economy in regional competitiveness. So uh, many firms and regions have this kind of intangible assets, uh, but they don't know how it can be converted as a uh, food tourism resource. <coughs> And the last example is kimchi. Does everybody knows kimchi? OK. So uh, kimchi is a Korean national dish, a uh, staple. Believe it or not, we do it every single day, kimchi. But it is possible because there exist over 100 different types of kimchi. So it's all local and seasonal. Uh, but um, Korea is uh, exporting um, nice kimchi, but we are importing a lot from foreign countries. So uh, we developed kimchi tour, kimchi trail, to educate Koreans and also foreigners who want to know more about kimchi. So um, because of the growing interest in quality kimchi uh, and the traditional sauce was there. So as you can see, it's kimchi. To make a good kimchi is all year round work. From having harvesting good salt, red pepper flake, uh, of course, the napa cabbage and everything so on, including the jar for kimchi, is very important. So if you have uh, the kimchi, uh, if you, after you, you participate the kimchi tour trail, you understand um, about the local ingredient, local people, about the kimchi culture and everything like that. So, I think understanding tourist perspectives in food and tourism is critical for leveraging the great benefits for destination. So it's not just about food. In order to utilize food tourism as an economic development driver, it is very important to encourage visitors to stop there, spend some money, and stay as long as possible. And to do so, it is crucial to develop and educate people. So it is not just about food-related industry, not just farm, food factories, but also um, the food-related re industry I wrote down here, like a, a travel agency, accommodations, hotels, of course. Uh, those things is very important to uh, develop the whole the gastronomy tourism. And mix and match. So gastronomic experience should not only encourage restaurants <coughs> or food producers to cooperate. It should be designed as a whole experience like this. So it should be designed to help every place like um, factories, culinary schools sometimes, traditional markets, of course, restaurants, hotels. And this is, I think, what um, is all about sustainability. If it is designed in this way. Uh, it could stay long. And uh, mix and match is a key word. A various contests include as, as much as you can in um, your culinary tour. OK, this is not just an ordinary mountain. It's all, all, all covered with the Napa cabbage, the kimchi cabbage. And this is the landscape of late summer, which is um, uh, July or August. I think the tourism destination starts from a beautiful landscape like this. And of course, you need culture. So if you happen to visit maybe Korea sometime, uh, contact me. And maybe I'll lead you to a kimchi trail or ginseng trail. Or I do have a lot more, you know, many, many courses that you might like. This was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yeah, You can be sure that we will do it. Uh, next time in Korea. Uh, well, the next speaker is our friend Nisha. She is from Singapore. Uh, she's a tourist practitioner, consultant, lecturer, and corporate trainer. She has a strong background in tourist research in the University of Murdoch, but she also she's also involved in regional consultancy work in the area of tourism and hospitality development in Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Vietnam, Malaysia, and many countries. Nisha, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, I come from Singapore, a nation of foodies. Uh, how many of you have been to Singapore? Okay, great. So you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's a national passion. Uh, it's not just consumption. You know, food is a form of conversation, right? So uh, when we when we greet one another, you know how we greet one another. No, it's not like we, we don't say how are you. We said have you eaten. <laughs> right, so, uh, so we, it's quite easy for us to understand the importance of gastronomy when it comes to Singapore, and I think we've been pretty successful. Um, but uh, I think in the age of disruption and in a, an experienced economy, uh, our country, Singapore, is also facing a lot of challenges with, with respect to gastronomy tourism. So I'll share with you a little bit in terms of, uh, from an academic perspective, as well as a consultant's perspective in terms of strategic planning and what works and what has not been working so well with us, right? So when, when you look at this slide, um, I, I purposefully have used the word flavoring gastronomy tourism with adaptation, innovation, and digital transformation. So uh, anybody can tell me, why do we use flavoring? Yeah, to make things more tasty, more interesting, more exciting, and more palatable. So it's the same. I think I view... Um, adaptation, innovation, and digital transformation in that way. We, we can make it exciting, we can make it more interesting, we can make it more palatable in terms of the consumer point of view. But at the same time, I think we should not compromise the, the humanistic perspective as well as the authenticity, right? So that's my stand, and this is how I'm going to take the uh, presentation. Right. Um, I would like to use this model. I'm sorry, my apology for not uh, referencing the, the author. This is not my model, but I'd like to use this to share a little bit in terms of value chain and how we could enhance the economic and social value uh, of the value chain. So there are two components, if you look at it. So uh, on one hand, we have the consumer. Uh, the, so the enhancement of the value chain, uh, it, you could look at it from the influence of the consumer market and the consumer perspectives. And on the other side is this whole evolution in terms of the experience economy, globalization, and digital transformation. So, uh, and we have factors over here, which is the social, cultural, environmental factors. So I share one or two points. Singapore faces plenty of challenges, but I share a few. One of it is that Singapore has a problem with land area, you know, so uh, agricultural land. Anybody has seen Singapore's agricultural land? Where do we grow it? Do we have agricultural land? No? We do, 0.1%. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you wonder, you know, we are supporting uh, gastronomy tourists coming to Singapore, so many tourists, and then we have our own population of about 5.8 million. So how are we feeding our people and the tourists? So you wonder, and it's going to get worse, no? We, we have a growing population, we have a growing tourism market, so we export, we export a lot uh, of food, but we, we can't do that forever, you know? So it's not sustainable, so the government is moving towards looking at what could we do to be more self-sustainable in the future. So you imagine, Singapore is this small, how are we going to find the land space? So if we go this way, there's Malaysia. We go this way, there's Indonesia. They're not going to be happy with us taking land there or here, right? So we have to do something. So when your countries are moving horizontally, Singapore is doing vertically, right? So our farming is and our gardens uh, are vertical. So we see plants happening on the side of buildings. Uh, we have farm that goes one over the other. And now we are also doing crab crab farming uh, in a vertical manner. So you can imagine mud crabs in a vertical manner, you know. So we have to find solutions, and technology is the way to go, right? And uh, the other big problem Singapore has is limited human resource, right? So we don't have a huge population with 2% or less unemployment. What are we going to do? So our government is then moving towards smart tourism. Right? Uh, sorry, smart, smart nation. So uh, in terms of payment mode, in terms of clearing, now we have robots going around clearing tables. 
right? So this sense of technology is being used in, in so many different ways. Uh, we are exploring new markets, so intelligence reports. We are trying to get uh, new markets that are emerging, and how do we capitalize on them using intelligence reports? So we are going after the first billion, which is the China market. The second billion? Anybody? The Indian market, right? So we, we have to find out about the Indian market. The third billion? The third billion, the halal market, the Muslim market, all right? So these three markets have got diverse interests, diverse uh, tastes, and diverse demands. So we have to do a lot of intelligence uh, report data to really find out about what this market wants. So there are big challenges, you know, but we can't do this without the use of technology, without the use of innovation. So I, I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to move on, because it looks like I'm only given two minutes and 15 seconds left. Right? So um, when we look at uh, creating high-value, sustainable gastronomy uh, tourism experience, I want to highlight four uh, in terms of what we are doing in Singapore. So we look, you look at the first one, is the understanding the new traveler. So um, like I mentioned, you know, everyone is going after the Chinese market, uh, Indian market, but we have a new emerging market, which is the the halal market, the Muslim market. So we, we have in the region uh, lots of halal tourists, and then we also have from the UAE coming in. But uh, we are looking at another niche market within this bigger uh, Muslim market, and that is the millennial Muslim market. So our consultancy did a research to find out what exactly does this millennial market really want. And one of the interesting things is that what are they looking at? Are they searching for information? These are digital natives. So you need to understand, are they going to TripAdvisor or are they having another platform? And we found that they are using other platforms, right? They are not using the typical TripAdvisor. So through this um, research, we need to look at where are they? What are they looking at? And with this intelligence, then you come up with uh, strategies and plans to be able to reach out to this particular market, right? So there's one example in which we are using technology. Uh, the other three I will go into the next slides to share a little bit. Um, I love this because um, it tells a little bit about the use of media, but we're not talking about social media here. We are talking about uh, serial dramas, right? Um, the, the Singapore government, in terms of Mediacom, we have Mediacom, what they did is that they produced this um, Pranakan, uh, little Nonia serial drama. I don't know how many of you follow Korean drama. Yeah, so you know, the Korean drama drives culinary tourists to Korea. A lot of Singaporeans go to Korea just for culinary tourism. So it's the same. This particular ethnic group is a very small population. Uh, very few people know the Peranakans exist in Singapore and the culinary of this Peranakan. So what the government did is produce a 34-part uh, serial in which the Peranakan culture, including the culinary of this market, was actually uh, put into the drama. But they did not just feature it in Singapore, broadcast in Singapore. We use Netflix, right? So uh, Netflix is the way to go. And we reach 86 million tourists in China and the region to be able to reach. So you have to use the new players. You have to use Netflix. You have to use Airbnb. You have to use the grab guys to be able to reach out to the market segment that's currently emerging. So. Um, what happened is that through this drama, we were able to romanticize the culture. So people got hooked on into this drama, and they got really interested. They started to search and Google and find out more about the Nonia culture. And they started to go into our ethnic enclave where these guys live and to find out more. So the use of creative and innovative media today we have to start to look at alternatives. And, and I'm just giving you a few things that we are trying to toy and play around in terms of gamification, for example, right? So if, if you look at the Pokemon craze, you know, it's crazy, you know, the Pokemon craze was going all around. So uh, we are trying to see if we could bring in heritage and gamification together and get people to play, because the millennials are about experience. You know, you have to play with them. It's not about educating them about the culture, but education has to come with a 
play element, right? So gamification could be the answer to using technology to engage the millennial uh, in terms of heritage and culture and gastronomy. Um, I want to share very quickly about this. This is pretty interesting. And those of you who have got mobile apps, uh, a smartphone, you may want to download and have a look at this thing called Pocket Trips, and the other, which is for tourists, uh, is called Locomo, L-O-C-O-M-O-L-E, Locomo. So you can download it, and it's so exciting because some of us went on a, on a walkabout tour this morning. I think most of you did that, yeah? So uh, it's the same idea, but what we are doing in Singapore is that we are using the use of a mobile application. So you are there, you download the Locomo, or this is actually meant for our students in Singapore, right? So that we get our students to be familiar with the heritage and gastronomy and culture so that the current generation will be ambassadors of the future generation, uh, as well as to the tourists. So uh, we have, we have uh, this company, the same company, and we work very closely with them. They came out with this thing called Locomol, and Locomol application can be downloaded. But what is the beauty of Locomol is that once you download it, you can go on a self-guided tour. Right? And when you're going on a self-guided tour, you are able to uh, have push notification. Uh, we have beacon technology, which is pushing to you. So you hold this, and once you recognize a building uh, or, or a restaurant that is already in your mobile app, it will be able to download and connect and send the information down to you. You're able to do P2P. You can take pictures. You can start sharing instantaneously. So if you look at the millennials, and this is for the millennials, they are not going to wait till they go to the airport to share, they are going to share instantly. So your mobile application got to provide, you know, Instagrammable moments. So they take this Instagrammable picture and they want to send immediately on a P2P sharing forum. So your mobile application should be able to do that. So um, when you put this on, there's a GPS hotspot information is being sent. You can go on a guided tour. You can send uh, photos. You can send information immediately. And we also design uh, an interactive uh, Q and A, right? So you can have question and answer, and and the millennials can actually uh, send the answer and see how intelligent they are in answering these questions. And um, you you could also upload video. So um, when. When, when a, a consumer who has this is going into a restaurant, they can download a video and get more information on that. So the mobile application does not replace the actual experience, but if you realize what I'm saying, it enhances the experience of the consumer. So this is going to be a big thing, and we are already experimenting. It is working really well. We have a few others uh, who are already doing it. Another one is Topo to go, T-O-P-O-G-O, -O -O, Topo to go, and that's for families. And they're also doing the same thing. They're downloading with your kids and they are interacting via the mobile application. Um, I have to stop. I'll probably talk about this when we have a Q and A uh, later. And thank you very much uh, for the time. And the next time, time. You, s you come to Singapore, you see a Singaporean. What's the question you should be asking them? Have you eaten? We I will love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very so much, know, Nisha. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the last speaker uh, is <laughs> Gael Van Hiu. Uh, does anyone yeah, uh, know this I red guy? <laughs> yeah? Do you know it? <laughs> then I think it's going to be easy to introduce you, Gael. But anyway, let me point out that she is the vice president of uh, Michelin. Food and Travel, and she's also head of marketing, communication, and sales for the Michelin Guide Thailand, and head of coordination for the Michelin Guide in Southeast Asia and Oceania. Thank you. The floor okay. is yours. Thank you. So the purpose of uh, this uh, short presentation is to uh, intro uh, introduce you to the Michelin Guide. I think that most uh, of you uh, uh, know the Michelin Guide uh, already, but uh, how uh, this guide who, uh, which was born in uh, 1900, uh, is still relevant uh, for destinations, not only uh, to uh, develop and preserve uh, uh, culinary uh, heritage, but to uh, be uh, still valuable to the end consumers, because this is in the DNA of, uh, of the Michelin Guide. So I am a VP for Southeast Asia for Michelin Experiences, 
because Michelin Experiences is a new department into the Michelin Group, uh, covering uh, all the, the, the pillars uh, related to uh, gastronomy, so the Michelin Guide, uh, uh, the uh, travel, and, um, and, and maps, because we have a, a strong uh, skills in uh, tourism through the Green Guide as well, and uh, 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 good skills in, uh, in, uh, in uh, travel and um, navigation. And we are developing uh, other uh, activities and uh, know-how. So through uh, Robert Parker, one ad advocate, a Singaporean uh, uh, company uh, uh, specialized in, uh, in the wine rating, of course, but a food event organization as well. Uh, Fooding, who, which is a, a French uh, uh, guide, a gastronomic guide, and book a table, uh, which is an online uh, booking uh, for restaurants. So about the Michelin Guide, so start, the Michelin Guide is part of the Michelin Group, a tire company. And it started with the vision of two brothers, the Michelin brothers, who at the, uh, uh, at the start of the, the uh, 19, uh, 1900 wanted to uh, help uh, drivers to uh, find good restaurants, where to find uh, uh, gas stations, uh, and uh, where to sleep so to, uh, to uh, accompany them in their travels. And it is still the, the purpose uh, of, of, the, of the Michelin Guide. And the Michelin Guide is still relevant because it, it follows the, the, the needs of the consumers. So we started in 1900, but the, 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 the stars uh, appeared only in 1926. So the Michelin stars are the, high, the, the top of the, of the, of the selection of, of the guide, but you will see, we are, uh, it's, uh, the, the Michelin guide uh, represents the whole di diversity of the food scene, and it's, uh, uh, the purpose is to be uh, heterogeneous and not only uh, for fine dining. Uh, then uh, in, uh, we introduced the Bib Gourmand, which is a, 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 a different distinction. Uh, and the only distinction of the Michelin Guide based on the value for money. It's the best meal for less than, uh, for in Europe, it will be for less than 40 euros, and in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Thailand, it's for less than 1,000 baht. Then we have the, the we, ex, we, we, we follow the, the trend of gastronomy, uh, gastronomy tourism because we started our inter international expansion uh, 10 years ago uh, with the US, uh, with uh, Tokyo, uh, with Japan, in Asia first, and then we went to Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, we are accelerating in, in Asia, uh, as you will see, uh, since uh, 2016. Uh, and the plate, which is the last distinction that we uh, integrated in, uh, in, uh, in the Michelin Guide, where we are uh, selecting where uh, restaurants uh, who deserve to be uh, in the Michelin Guide because it is fresh ingredients, well cooked, but they don't deserve uh, a star. So, yes, we are uh, present in 31 uh, 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 qu uh, countries. So the, the, the latest uh, uh, countries we covered are uh, so Singapore in 2016, uh, uh, Seoul uh, as well, and Bangkok uh, and, uh, and Taipei uh, last year. So, and we are extending to, uh, to Phuket uh, for the second edition in Thailand to cover the, the southern uh, uh, cuisine and the Peranakan uh, 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 cuisine of, uh, of Phuket and Pangla. So, yes, uh, uh, all around the world, uh, we are uh, rating 20,000 restaurants, and amongst these 20,000 uh, restaurants, only uh, 2,000, uh, uh, less than uh, 3,000 uh, are stars. So this, is, uh, this, uh, this uh, can assess the, the diversity of the selection. It's not only uh, for high-end tourists, and uh, who can afford to, uh, to, 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 to dine uh, every, every day uh, and every meal in, uh, in, Mich in Michelin stars uh, restaurants, but it's for a, uh, any kind of consumers and any kind of budgets. So the, the idea is to, it will benefit uh, all the value chains all, and uh, all the different communities. 
So what makes uh, the, the Michelin Guide still relevant and still unique is the methodology uh, of the selection. Uh, first, uh, all the inspectors, uh, uh, they are uh, professionals. They have a food and beverage background. Some of them uh, used to be chefs, uh, used to be uh, restaurant owners or uh, uh, hotel managers. Uh, and they are Michelin employees. They do not work for other panels. They do not write for any other food reviews. They are Michelin employees. So they are experts, as I said. And when they visit a restaurant, it's like in the, what you see, uh, you can watch in the movies, they are uh, anonymous. They pay for the bill and they visit the restaurant as a regular consumer. So that's why we, we, the first uh, uh, purpose of the Mission Guide is to help the consumer to make the, better, the, 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 the best choice. And the consistency uh, is very uh, important because the, our inspectors, they visit the, uh, the, the restaurants several times and we, uh, what, when you have a restaurant re uh, selected in the mission guide, it means that the, propose, the, the value pro uh, proposal is consistent from the starter to the dessert. So for the Michelin star, the Michelin star restaurants, stars restaurants, we uh, apply a f a five criteria uh, across all the countries and the same cr criteria. The quality of ingredients, which uh, uh, of course will have an impact on the sourcing and will benefit uh, the, the, all the value chain from the, the producers to uh, the, the restaurant owners. The personality of the, of the cuisine, so of course uh, the personality of the chef, but uh, as well the, uh, the, the enhancement of the local heritage and the development to a next level. Uh, the mastery uh, of uh, techniques and flavors. So this is very uh, differentiating uh, for, uh, the, from the rest uh, of uh, the, the ratings, is that creativity is, uh, is acknowledged, but it must be uh, uh, grounded on solid cooking techniques. And not only cooking techniques from Europe or from France, but local cooking techniques consistency, as I already explained, and quali uh, quality uh, price ratio, good value for money. You pay, but the experience that you have, worth it. So, in the, so we have one, two, three stars. Of course, uh, when uh, it impacts on the revenues of, uh, of the restaurants, as soon as you have one star, you, you can be sure that your, your, the turnover of, uh, uh, of the restaurant can be impacted of 20%. Uh, generally, uh, when you have two stars, it's 40%. And when you have three stars, it's 100%. So for one star is that it's, a high, uh, it's high quality cooking worth a stop. Excellent cooking worth a detour and exceptional cuisine worth a special journey. So, of course, uh, everybody is dreaming of three stars, but uh, uh, among the, uh, the 20,000 restaurants uh, uh, rated, uh, we only have 133 stars restaurants all over the world. So it's a very, very small community. Bib Gourmand, so best value for money, very good meal at good prices, and Michelin plates, uh, restaurants serving uh, fresh ingredients, carefully prepared, and this it's 40% of the uh, of the uh, of the guy. Bib Gourmand, 17%, and stars for. Uh, for uh, 14%. That's why most of the destinations and uh, most of our communication uh, is focused on stars and Bib Gourmand because it, it, it is what is specific to Michelin. So, yes, uh, as a conclusion, and I think we will, uh, I will go through these different uh, uh, impacts uh, uh, along our discussion, that first, we, when we, you ha a Michelin guide uh, uh, arrives in a city, and uh, provides uh, ratings, it rate buzz, because uh, you have a big, big, big media coverage. Uh, oh, everybody is talking about, uh, about it, from Bangkok Post to New York Times and, uh, uh, and, uh, and main uh, uh, newspapers and media uh, in, uh, all over the world. It will enhance the image of the, uh, of the destination, uh, putting in on the, uh, on, the, on the map as a foodie destination, and. Uh, with the Michelin Guide, it's a certification. 
it will attract more tourists because uh, uh, when uh, tourists are looking uh, for information to select uh, their next destination, as uh, food and uh, gastronomy uh, uh, now is a key pillar uh, of, uh, of their trip, uh, it's a certification of a good quality made by experts, which make the difference with the, the consumer reviews that you can find on any di digital platforms, and especially for high-end consumer, but for all the consumers. I think it's a guarantee and a certification uh, uh, made by uh, professionals. It will increase revenues and improve quality. And it is this uh, chain of reaction and the, the improvement of quality that makes valuable for all the value chain of, uh, of gastronomy. So thank you, and then we, I think we can thank you. Thank move you to much. the... Yeah. Thank you all for your presentations. And uh, as a uh, difference, as I highlighted in my brief presentation on the decision, we found ourselves between uh, two different levels. By one side, we have the value change of gastronomy tourism and the life cycle of the tourist experience in the digital age. And we know, obviously, that uh, this value change is very heterogeneous and fragmented. Then, uh, and this is an open question, uh, uh, do you think that the different agents that uh, we can find in the value change of gastronomy tourism uh, are ready to face the challenge of today? You want okay. to start? Okay. Well, it depends. Yeah. Do, do, do the different um, parts of the value chain can they access the, the tourism uh, client as, as it is today? Um, depends. Depends a lot on the place and depends on the type of, of activity. Uh, for example, um, this take a destination where it has a strong uh, uh, positioning as a agro, uh, the agro-tourism, like for example, some destinations in France or, or Argentina or Spain, they have a tradition. Well, ha usually what happens is that providers, uh, suppliers, are not tourism providers. They can make cheese, but they, cannot, uh, they do not necessarily know how to run a tour. So what works very well is programs that uh, provide standards and a brand, a brand that all these uh, small providers go to the market under, uh, for example, Farms of France, or they um, build on certifications like organic. Uh, anything that the market recognizes can be used to enhance and promote the tourism experience. But uh, for somebody who's uh, traditionally been like a farmer or a merchant, to go into the tourism uh, industry, what um, I think probably the best way to go is through one of these programs that uh, um, are much easier recognized by the, by, the, by the tourist, can be marketed at a much cheaper cost since you are working with one brand for the whole destination. And they provide uh, economies of scale. You can train people to how to run a tour, how to make a bed, how to prepare a meal, and how to work with tourism operators that sometimes have problems finding these suppliers. And I know you probably can talk a lot about that. Right. So that's, that's my opinion, that there's many ways, but probably um, going through one big, big uh, uh, policy or, or one way win of action is much easier than uh, attempting a thousand little, uh, little businesses or little opportunities. Yeah. What do you think, Gia? Yes. Gia, because you have a strong relation with, yeah. with different actors of, the, of this value change. Are all the they change. prepared or we have to work? With Some them. Of the, yeah, there's an issue about this in Korea as well. Some small farmers, uh, actually, the first generation, they was born, you know, and then worked as a farmer since they was like 15, 17. Mm. And then now he's 70 something and uh, people are telling them that, okay, you are a tourism tour destination. You have to develop, put more services, something like that but uh, there are difficulties for them. So one of uh, the projects that uh, South Korea is doing uh, since eight years ago um, is helping them put, um, do a consulting, and we do have an educational program for them to, so that, for example, uh, a small farmer who's making a soybean paste or kuchujang, which is a 
red pepper paste. They need to promote their product, but uh, small, you know, the farmers, they cannot promote themselves, right? They're not big producers. So developing um, in a tourism, as a tourism destination, as a whole experience, the chain, um, the people visit the farm, they experience, they eat, they listen to their storytelling, something like that, and then understand more. So in the long term, eventually, they can promote through uh, culinary tourism. So I think that can be a one good example. Uh -huh. Nisha, yeah. you have a great experience, um, and in many countries, then you have different points of view. Okay, I'll just take it from this perspective uh, to, to discuss this. So if you take it, that was one of my slides, but I didn't yeah. put that up. So if you take this hypothetical situation where uh, a consumer who wants to make a cake comes to you, you yeah. know, and you can sell eggs, you can sell flour individually, and you charge, say, a dollar, right? And the second way to add value is to go one step up and say, I put all this together and put it into a nice package and make it into a cake mix and give it to the consumer and you make, say, $5. Uh, the third way to progress up is to bake a cake according to what they want and then uh, customize it, put it into a really nice box and then make, say, $50. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to move a little higher, you can. You know, you, you take the cake, you bring Mickey Mouse to their house and do a little nice party and you add that experience to the whole th uh, you know, party and you make a hundred dollars. So it's that way, you know, if your consumer has moved to that experience economy and is there, you don't stay at eggs and fly or, or just a cake box. You've got to start moving up. And I think technology enhances that. So if you want to make more economic and social value, then you have to move up in the progression uh, and have a good fit with the experience economy in an age of disruption, where are you going to differentiate yourself as a producer, primary or secondary, uh, or retailer, as well as a destination? Where do you want to differentiate yourself and be competitive, but at the same time be economically sustainable? and yeah, socially sustainable. So you have to start looking at how digitalization, globalization, adaptation, and innovation can be leveraged. And I don't want to use the word exploited because leverage has got a more positive connotation to that. Yeah. Gail, what do you think? Yes, for me, it's a, yes, from, from a consumer uh, point yeah. of view, uh, it's to, uh, to help yes, the, the consumer make the, the best choice uh, between what he can find on the uh, package and very marketed uh, uh, tourism offer on uh, all the digital platforms that we all use, on all the different mobile applications that uh, uh, are uh, existing to, to today, and uh, the, uh, the expertise of real food experts. And I think this is uh, the certification and the guarantee that the Michelin Guide uh, uh, is uh, is bringing to 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 the to the consumer is the balance uh, between uh, all the consumer reviews and all the 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 the, 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 the foodies that uh, uh, talk about food like a passion and Michelin in uh, Michelin the guide reviews uh, who talk about food like uh, like ex like experts and this is very valuable uh, as well for uh, for the consumer when they they go back home for the tourists because uh, they are not as you said in your presentation uh, are talking about what they, they 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 have been eating for two weeks but what they have been experiencing and the the to to be able to to talk about the local ingredients the local cooking techniques, the history be between each dish. And this, all this storytelling, this, the Michelin Guide is a help, is, is, a, is, a, is a contributor. It's not uh, only uh, it's good and the, the restaurant is, 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 uh, is, uh, is pleasant and the, and the staff was very helpful. Uh, it's uh, all the storytelling and uh, the, with a strong fact checking, of course, uh, behind each review. Okay, thank you. Nisha, you, you pointed out the, 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 the topic of uh, sustainability. Uh, you know that this is one of the topics that 
this, this, the, whole, the whole meeting. And I know that you have an interesting opinion about uh, how we manage uh, this, 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 this concept of sustainability. I would like you to share with us, because I think it's, 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 it's very interesting, uh, your, your point of view. I think there should be a, a shift in the mindset of how we approach and educate, especially the millennial generations, about sustainability. I think we have to reevaluate the messages we are giving at the moment. I think most messages are grounded on fear, and guilt. So don't do this, you know, if not, you're going to kill the earth, you know, or, or don't consume shark's fin, if not. So it's ridden on a lot of fear and guilt, and it's not going to work with the millennials. So how do we then ground it on positive reinforcement? So it's not about don't, don't, don't do, don't do unsustainable uh, acts, but it's about how do we foster sustainable acts, reinforce and spread the positive messages of adopting uh, sustainable and responsible behavior. So I'll just give you an, a real, an example. Uh, recently, I was in the Maldives, and instead of, I think, uh, one of the resorts, instead of saying, don't do this, don't do that, what they did is that they tried to make tree planting as a, as a way of leaving behind something really enjoyable, cleaning the reefs as something that is part and parcel of the tourist experience. So if you make it so part and parcel and almost intuitive in, in us, then I think it's much better than giving that message of don't do this, don't do that, very patronizing about being responsible, which is not going to go down too well with the millennials. Okay. Uh, are you agree? with this point of view that uh, we don't have to say only don't, don't, don't. <laughs> we have to make it different. Thinking in, 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 in how to, 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 to make an approachment to this, all these, these actors of the, the, the value change of gastronomy tourism. Our protection comes from appreciation. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the storytelling mm -hmm that you were talking about, and I think it's very important for a destination because at, at the end you're, 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 you're selling a promise when you're marketing a destination, and then you have to make sure that the promise is real. But that promise has to be about something that is uh, exciting and, and, and a learning experience or something that can fulfill a need uh, to the person. And that need can be anything. It can be the, the need to just enjoy yourself and have a good time. But often it has to do with, uh, with uh, a personal enhancement, with a learning, with, with something that will make me a better person, a more interesting person. Um, I will connect that with also personal branding that uh, now we're all very concerned about. And nothing uh, tells more about you uh, as, as uh, being able to transmit that you, you are doing things the right way. And connecting with that um, narcissism that I think yesterday was also on the, on the, on the, on the table, I think it's also a, a, a way that is working, for example, to protect heritage and, and material heritage. And I don't see why it will not work in, in a gastronomic uh, context, because at the end it's the same thing. You're, you're, you, have a, you have some kind of value, uh, heritage often, uh, values associated with the conservation of the land, the ways of life that are cool to talk about and, and are cool to take a photo of. And, 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 and there, there's many positive ways that you can be sending the same messages to, to a generation that is deeply narcissistic. Well, um, <laughs> one, yeah, it's, know, it's, we, we don't have time to, 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 <laughs> to discuss about all, 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 the, all, the, all the topics. But uh, one, one of the goals of this, this, this table is, is, is to discuss uh, about uh, how to increase the economic uh, participation of the different actors of the, uh, of the, of the actors of the, um, of the gastronomy tourist value exchange. What, can we do it? How, how can we do it? How can we increase the, 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 the importance of the economy of the different actors of the, of the value change? Um, okay, maybe I'll just share from my point of view. I think uh, earlier, Dr. 
uh, Ian Yeoman was saying, a really interesting point about visionary leadership. And I think I, I take it from Singapore's case study. Uh, one of the ways in which we were able to enhance uh, the value of gastronomy tourism is through our visionary leadership, where I think the government gives a signal as to how we should move towards enhancing the value. So whether it's technology, uh, the funds that has come in is enormous in support of the adoption of technology or differentiated marketing or intelligence reports to understand these market segments. So our government, I think, sets the path for us on how we should differentiate, uh, makes available the funds for us, and uh, strategies are, are given to us. So what we do, we just adopt, and we innovate, and it's made easier for us to differentiate. Yeah. yeah. For example, the, 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 the last picture that I, I stopped at you, uh, with the hawkers, this new uh, hipster hawkers. Oh, I yeah, OK. Do, do Maybe I'll share a little is, bit is, about It's a good example uh, how to how to manage it. Yeah, so uh, if you go to Singapore, uh, predominantly, I think more than 90% of the population eat at hawker centers and food court. But we got a, a bit of a dangerous situation where the hawkers and the generation of hawkers today, they're disappearing. So uh, what do we do for the next generation? How do we sustain our hawker culinary skills, which is so part of Singapore's identity? Uh, and in, a, in, our, in an economy where there's a low uh, unemployment rate, how do we get the younger generation to adopt uh, the hawker gastronomy. So what the government is doing is making it very hip to be a hawker. Mm. So we are getting uh, young hawkers who are hunks, you know, who, who look good, uh, to be ambassadors. And then we have a hawker academy where the government fully funds and they get the older hawkers to train the younger hip guys. And then these guys use the social media to show how hip it is to be hawkers. So there are lots of funds available for the younger generation and as well as the older generation, the incentive for them to pass it on to the next generation. So it's a really interesting. Some of my students, I train them to be in the hospitality industry and then they come back to me and say, guess what, Nisha, I'm a hawker now. You know, and, and they say it's so cool. So, so much so that a hawkering looks like a real hip thing to be. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And also you were talking about how to make uh, I, I, make sure that you have a lasting and uh, the deeper uh, impact, econ economic impact, and for uh, across the value chain. And um, things that have worked very well are not only greasing the value chain locally, that, as we know, it, uh, the local value chains basically work for, for high-end restaurants that, that shop, you know, kilometer zero, organic and all that. But for the rest of the, uh, of the, of the restaurant business, uh, that doesn't work that way because price is a, is a, is a, huge, um, um, is a huge, it's a huge fact there that it really, really keeps the, uh, the, the local chain away. However, you can create opportunities for producers uh, that to sell directly to the uh, to the tourist, and you do that through brands, and you do that also making sure that the businesses are competitive and that they understand the market, and and. I guess, for example, that they can work with a tour operator and the tour operator can rest assured that they're going to, to be providing the best service possible in their way. So that's the kind of things that you need to be doing to make sure that the growth is not sust only sustainable but sustained. Because uh, you can only create uh, development with sustained growth. It's keeping the rates up all the time. Okay. And just my last question because our time is almost over. Uh, but I want just to make uh, last questions before to, to give some, I think someone from the audience wants to make a question or to make a, a comment is uh, uh, Gia. Uh, uh, in, in this context of globalization or digital transformations, uh, how can we work uh, taking care of uh, authenticity uh, in, in our destinations? Yes, um, everything is you know, globalizing nowadays. But uh, people always has the instinct to crave scarcity. scarcity. So I think uh, the sooner the globalization is, the more curiosity about uniqueness, about the culture. So there is a market for that. So um, I think people are scared of losing, you know, authenticity. But uh, compared to a decade ago, it is rising, you know, as a more important thing. 
So I think uh, we'll never lose authenticity somehow. And, <laughs> and Gail, what do you think? Because uh, I, I noticed that your, 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 your company, the Michelin Guide, is interested not only in this uh, yes. three Michelin star restaurants, you are interested uh, also in, in this local identity, this authenticity. Uh, how can we do it? Of course, the, 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 the Michelin Guide uh, yes, helps uh, to uh, preserve and develop the, 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 the culinary uh, heritage. Uh, because local, uh, when uh, a Michelin Guide is, uh, is covering a destination, it means that you have a strong potential. And the strong potential uh, it relies on a strong culinary heritage. So for Thailand, uh, for example, uh, we, we have uh, some Thai restaurants uh, being stars. We have many bib gourmands uh, th uh, for, thai, for Thai restaurants. And I, I am sure that in the, in the upcoming years, we, we will have more and more, uh, uh, more and more, more stars, Michelin star restaurants doing Thai cuisine and it will benefit all the value, sh value chain because ch chefs, they will uh, looking for uh, better quality. So from the, the ingredients, encouraging uh, local production. So for example, in Thailand, you have a local production of caviar, which is uh, for forests. Um, but yes, you can source. Uh, it will uh, in to improve uh, the, the local production, and it will uh, improve uh, the development of uh, local talents uh, as well. So it will create uh, uh, jobs, uh, because lo the local uh, manpower uh, will be trained by of course, uh, maybe uh, chefs coming from abroad uh, at the beginning because the, the, the restaurant owners and investors, they, 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 will, they will have to, uh, to, 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 to rely on uh, uh, already uh, recognized uh, Michelin chefs, but it's the start of the journey. Uh, I think in five years, you will have more uh, Thai chefs uh, awarded, and you will have uh, uh, more um, uh, Thai people uh, in, uh, in the, fi in the f f f food and beverage industry are uh, very well trained, and uh, this is uh, the, the, the value of uh, uh, this kind of certification. Okay, thank you very much. I apologize because we don't have time, but I just, uh, just for two questions. I think there's one. Can you go to the microphone? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Sayer Aziz from Morocco. Uh, well, thank you for, to all speakers here for their uh, well, excellent yeah, presentations. Yeah, the first question is to Laura. Uh, well, uh, I'm working with a, a cooperative, a women cooperative in Morocco, in south of Morocco. Well, they are collecting mussels. Uh, they, are, they are on the Atlantic Ocean, and they are drying the mussels and then selling the mussels. But during your presentation, then it came to my mind, okay. your, why not to work, of course, here on gastronomy tourism? I would like to, well, to know if there is any way yeah, to, uh, to benefit from your experience and to benchmark on the, your experience, and also about the sources of uh, funding for a similar uh, yeah, experience. And then, uh, Nisha, have you eaten? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so uh, while well, you talked about the adaptation, yeah, innovation, and you talked about yeah, halal uh, tourism. Well, as you know, halal tourism is not just about, of course, yeah, the halal food. It's about the whole environment that you offer, of course, to this market. Yeah. Uh, well, the case of Singapore, don't you think that if you're going to develop halal tourism, you are intending to attract a market, but maybe you're going to keep away uh, another market. Uh, because as I said, sometimes in halal tourism, there are those who require even separate swimming pools for men, women, etc. This is about the whole environment. My last question to the last speaker. Oh. Uh, She's our three. Uh, <laughs> sorry, very quickly. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Je parle de votre nom. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, is uh, just I've heard that Michelin is extending its rating to small businesses also and uh, to the food yeah, businesses. Is it true? If not, why not? Thank so, you. Well, uh, so my name is Gail. Well. <laughs> 
And uh, uh, yes, we, uh, the, we cover uh, small businesses uh, as well. Uh, so the, one of the, the, the most relevant example is uh, in Thailand, we, we, uh, we awarded the one star to J5, uh, who is an iconic uh, uh, street food in, uh, in, in Bangkok. It's a small business because she's uh, the only one, uh, she's cooking, she's uh, uh, sourcing the, the products, and uh, that's why she, she serves only uh, uh, 20 people, uh, 20 people uh, uh, on the uh, at the time uh, by by day each day, uh, and but even without uh, Michelin star, yes, we you have uh, you have a street uh, street food, uh, small uh, small shops uh, doing uh, uh, crab or uh, other uh, uh, typical uh, dishes uh, in uh, in Chinatown. And it's not only about fine dining and uh, uh, five, five stars uh, uh, hotels or restaurants. Yes, it's uh, all the all type of uh, of cuisines and all type of uh, of restaurants. Yeah. Shall I take that? Yeah. So thank you for asking that question. It gives me a little bit of time to explain, <laughs> which I didn't earlier. Not, yeah. You don't have much time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when you, you, you asked an absolutely wonderful question about halal tourism, what exactly we are talking about. So um, when, you, when we did the research, it's, it's not just about you know, uh, halal food, but there's a lot more in terms of um, uh, facilities that should be provided for the halal tourists, in, in, even in the restaurant. But uh, in the research, we found that it's, it's not just about providing halal food in terms of, you know, removal of pork or whatever, but the halal tourists, especially the millennial tourists, are willing to compromise in terms of in a destination which does not uh, provide uh, exactly, we're talking about halal food, but they're willing to compromise in terms of going into vegetarian restaurants, vegan restaurants, or seafood restaurants. So if you understand from this research, which is available, and anyone who's interested to find out a little bit more, you can approach me, I can tell you where to, to get the report or send it to you. But what we are trying to, to give is an understanding to destinations that it is not as inhibitive as you think, because that market is actually very open. Uh, and many, many destinations have the ability to adapt to this particular market. You don't have to do an overhaul uh, of your restaurants or your hotel just to accommodate to this market. So interestingly, we have Spain uh, that has approached us and we're doing some training for Spain uh, because you're very near the generating market. You have similarity in the heritage and it's, it's possible to adapt to what this market requires. South Africa, for example, has come on board and say, we, we want to learn how to convert this information that you have received to strategies to accommodate to the halal market. So it's not as difficult as we think if we look at the, the information that this research is trying to show to us. All you need is a little bit of guidance as to how you could uh, implement it and strategically get the market to come over. So I think Indonesia has got plenty of potential. Uh, Korea is doing a wonderful job uh, although it is not a Muslim nation. Japan is one of the leading destinations for the halal market at the moment. Thailand is joining and uh, going on board to uh, attract this particular. Philippines has got a, a guide just to bring in that market. So we are talking about uh, countries which are not Muslim and they want to attract this market because it's not that difficult to attract this market. I hope I have answered your question. <laughs> Uh, Laura. And okay. <laughs> not, okay. <Shortly. laughs> not knowing anything about, about your place and your women and your muscles, um, I, will, I will just ask you a few things. For example, are, you ne are they near or at a destination that they can... Uh, I'm just going to throw a couple of ideas, but uh, directly, you know, how do you match them directly with, with, uh, with a tourism experience? Can you create one? A, if that experience is going to be successful, you have to be near or at a destination that already has the infrastructure and services and all that, and, and you can pair them up maybe with a, with a local operator, with hotels, and, and create something. What's the story? What's special about those muscles and those women? Do they have songs? 
Um, do they have a preparation that is very local, very typical? Where is the story? Because I'm sure you can find many, many, many ways to wrap up that experience in value that uh, can you convey to somebody that's going to be relevant and important. And if you're not near any destination, um, how about becoming a, a supplier for the restaurant industry? and making uh, a, a restaurant have those muscles uh, on their menu with their story. Uh, muscles from wherever they are, that they're very special because they use this, 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 and that, and that. There's many ways, either as a direct provider of, of, of tourism services or as a supplier, for, uh, a third-party supplier, and that would be my guess, <laughs> without knowing anything about, about your... You, we can talk later if you want to. Okay, I <laughs> apologize. We have to finish. Our time is over. But anyway, you have to think that this, this is a place for networking. Our, our excellent uh, speakers are going to be with us uh, the rest of the day. Then you have the opportunity to speak with them. Then thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. And see you soon. Thank you.